Think the government can just keep printing money to pay its bills? Think again. We're sitting on a ticking time bomb of debt that could trigger a financial crisis like we've never seen before. Legendary financial expert Jim Rickards warns that the U.S. debt-to-GDP ratio is completely unsustainable, and if something doesn't change, defaulting on debt might be the only option. Are you ready for what comes next? Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. I'm your guide on navigating the world of finance, and today we're diving into one of the biggest dangers looming over the global economy government debt. In this video, we'll explore Jim Rickards' warning about an inevitable debt crisis, the risks of inflation, and what you can do to protect yourself. Stick around, because by the end, you'll know exactly how to safeguard your investments in these uncertain times. These bank loans happen faster than anyone can contemplate. So the vulnerabilities in the in-between, who are they? These are banks that have between roughly 200 billion and 900 billion of assets. I think with banks, you have to sort of take a three-tiered approach. There are small community banks that are actually very sound. I do some of my banking with a bank that was founded in um, 1877. I figure, all right, you made it through the panic of 1907, the panic of 1898, the Great Depression, uh, the tequila crisis, long-term capital, Russia. You made it through all that, so you must be doing something right. Yeah, look at the balance sheet, do your homework, but some of those banks are just fine. Then there are the banks that are absolutely positively too big to fail. I mean, the technical term is globally systemic, important GSI institutions, and we know who they are. It's JP Morgan Chase, Citi, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, Wells Fargo, Truist, is a dopey name, but Truist, uh, and a couple others on the list, and they are absolutely too big to fail, which doesn't mean the stock price can't go down. See, that's the thing. If you're a depositor, yeah, you care about bank failures, you care about FDIC insurance and so forth. If you're a creditor, note holder, you care about all this stuff. But if you're a stockholder, you can lose a lot of money in a bank that does not fail just because the equity takes a beating. But the real vulnerability is in between, not the little guys who have been around and who pass. Uh, by the way, a ratio that very few people look at that has become very important in determining the soundness of a bank, look at the ratio of insured deposits to total deposits. Because deposits over $250,000 are not insured. Now, there's a whole bunch of technical. You can have two accounts, and you and your wife can have separate accounts, and you can go to separate banks. There are ways to get that insured balance up into the millions if you read the fine print on the FDIC website. But it's a lot of work, and do read the fine print. But as a heuristic, as a rule of thumb, $250,000 per account in the same bank is the ceiling on deposit insurance. Well, Silicon Valley Bank, which failed in March 2023, their insured deposits were 3%. They were 97% uninsured deposits, including all the Silicon Valley startups, but some big companies as well. Cisco had an account there. One of the big uh, Bitcoin uh, custodians had an account there. They kept their cash there. Some of these accounts were in the billions of dollars. They were not insured. And so if there's a run on a bank and before the regulators even get out of bed, you know, depositors are taking their money out. We all remember, you know, grainy black and white pictures from the 1930s of guys in overcoats and fedoras lined up around the bank trying to get their money before the doors closed, and usually they didn't. But the 21st century equivalent of that is someone with a cell phone doing an online withdrawal, sending it to another account, and then and texting their friends, hey, get your money out now, happening at the speed of light and with exponential impact a little faster than word of mouth it's like word of uh, text well to your point ticker changes all the time but i just took a glance at it. it's actually 2470 uh you're right it got to the 2400 level and sustained that you're absolutely right it's 2470 which is i think a tick from the all-time high it might actually be the all-time high if it's a closing price i think it was an intraday it might have been 2471 that's basically the all-time high and my view is that tells you almost nothing about gold and it tells you a lot about the dollar when I see a higher dollar price for gold, I don't say, oh, gee, gold's going up. What I say is, hey, the dollar's crashing. Now, you don't see that in cross rates. You don't see it against the euro, the Swiss franc, uh, Japanese yen, Chinese yuan, the Bloomberg dollar index, DXY, which the Wall Street Journal uses. You look at every single one of those, and the dollar is very strong. Uh, you know, the yen, I, I debate internally, it was, oh, the yen will never get to 150. It hit 160. Remind people, when I started the banking business, the yen was 400. I've seen this movie before. Uh, you know, the, the double-digit yen is not in stone, so to speak. Uh, so 
So yen 160 didn't surprise me. But you say, well, Jim, isn't the dollar strong? The indices are up. The other currencies are down. The cross rates favor the dollar, et cetera, et cetera. The answer is yes, if that's your measuring stick. But all you're doing is comparing one central bank currency to another central bank currency. But think of them all as survivors in a lifeboat with no food or water. I mean, they're all going down together. The point is, that's not the best way to measure dollar strength because, all, all your, yeah, I can see a preference for the dollar over the euro. I can think, given a war in Ukraine, I can think of a hundred reasons why that's true. Same thing with the yuan. The Chinese economy is imploding. I could favor dollars over yuan. But those are all cross rates, currency to currency. They don't tell you very much to the extent that there are common factors in all central bank currencies. If you want to know what the dollar is doing, look at gold. Gold, I'll say silver, but silver is kind of a tag along. So let's talk about gold. Gold uh, and silver are the only forms of money that are not also forms of debt. Take a $20 bill out of your wallet and read it. It's, it's actually a contract between the government and the people. So read the contract. It says at the top, Federal Reserve note. Note is debt. And go to the Fed website, look at the balance sheet. Where's M1 or M0 or any or currency? It's on the liability side, which is a form of debt. Uh, and that's that, like an earth-shaking revolution. But most people think of it as an asset. Well, it might be your asset, but it's their debt. Uh, it's government debt. <clears throat> Treasury knows government debt, even though they're very liquid. And you can, you can sell them and you can sell them to the Fed and get cash. So all forms of money are forms of debt. And debt and credit, the two sides of the same coin, are the key to commerce and, uh, and mercantile success, etc. But gold is not. Gold is, is a form of money, the best form in my view, but it's not a form of debt. So it has that kind of purity, no pun intended, as a yardstick, as a measuring rod, because you're not measuring with the same thing. You're using something different to measure the object. And so, again, gold at an all-time high, I say fine. Dollars at an all-time low. That's kind of a wake-up call for people who keep talking about strong dollar, strong dollar, because, you know, there's that old uh, 1969 live performance in the Montreux Jazz Festival. The song was called Compared to What? And... Uh, <laughs> Great song. When people say, is the dollar stronger? How's the dollar doing? I, I say, compared to what? You know, if, against the euro, uh, against the yuan, yeah, very strong. Against gold, not so much. So I would expect gold to go higher because I would expect the dollar to continue to weaken as the U.S. debt exceeds $35 trillion, as the U.S. debt to GDP ratio exceeds 130%, highest in history. 130% debt to GDP ratio, you know, government debt's the numerator, GDP's the denominator, over 130%. Who's at that lunch table? The answer is Lebanon, Greece, and our friends in Italy. It's basically the biggest super debtors in the world. And Japan, of course, is in detention. They're like uh, 300% or something, um, sorry, over 200%. Everyone says, does that mean the dollar collapses tomorrow? And the answer is no. It doesn't mean the dollar collapses tomorrow. It doesn't mean the treasury market collapses tomorrow. I say, what if the Chinese stop buying? No big deal. Just call Jamie Dimon and say, Jamie, shoot him. And, you know, the banks will do what they're told. They've been trained. It doesn't mean the end of the dollar or the end of the treasury market, but it is indicative of much slower growth at best. Again, you can still have your technical recessions within a long, what's called a long depression. I would say, uh, and others agree that Japan has been in a recession, sorry, a depression, has been in a depression since 1989. Now, they've had nine technical recessions. You know, they can't get out of it. Uh, they can't get out of the rut. They've had nine technical recessions over those 30 years, 30 plus years. I'm sorry, I guess 35 years at this point. Um, nine technical recessions, but one very long depression. I would say the United States has been in a depression since 2007. Now, we've had one severe technical recession in 2008-2009. We had a recession that's not a recession. Don't call it a recession, said Janet Yellen. In the first two quarters of 2022, we had two consecutive quarters of declining GDP in the first half of 2022. Why was that not a recession? Because Janet Yellen said, don't call it a recession. And the National Bureau of Economic Research, which are the umpires, you know, they haven't said so. So... Okay, I guess it never happened, but the data is you, your GDP went down two quarters in a row. So count that as a mild a mini recession. But it's been one long depression, particularly the episode from 2009 to 2019, when compound annual growth over that 11-year period was 